Virajan Brahmanishkalam Tachu Brahm Jyoti Sham Jyoti Tadyadatma Vito Vidduhu Shining like burnished gold, highest and deepest, the core intelligence of living beings, partless and indivisible, free of any and all taint. the essence of existence which all beings seek, either knowingly or unknowingly, there shines Brahman, the reality. It is that which the Guru teaches. It is that which the wise ones exult in. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Vedanta Siddhanta Nirukti Resha Brahmaiva Jivaham Sakalam Jagadcha Akanda Rupa Stitir Eva Moksho Brahma Dvitiye Shrutayaha Pramanam Om Shantihi 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 It is the sure and certain proof of the Vedanta that all is Brahman, time, space, living beings, and the world. Living in constant recognition of this fact is what is called enlightenment. Brahman is pure and perfect, and one without a second. And the revealed scriptures are the apt and final proof of this fact. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Sahana, Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai. Tejasvi navadita mastu ma vidhi shovahai Om shanti 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 May Brahman, a reality, protect us. May Brahman sustain us. May Brahman illumine our thinking process. May we not find fault with each other, with the world, or with the teachings. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om. Some of us have gathered here today at the SRV Ashram in a little town on the Big Island of Hawaii called Honoka'a. And we are very blessed to be able to dive into subjects of spiritual nature, which are rather rare in this day and age. Subjects like the four yogas, and 
the Vedanta that we just chanted about, Tantra, Buddhism, Samkhya, Jainism, all the Astaka and Nastika philosophies of India, <coughs> which we will talk about today in regards to this chart, which you see the master copy of in front of you now. Last week we didn't have it quite fleshed out, but now we have the entire terrain, if you might call it, of Divine Mother there in visual form. We can see just a few of the entries of her divine wisdom. All those words that are singular words in Sanskrit, but which, since we have no equivalent words for them in English, we need to look into these so-called foreign languages, especially this ancient one called Sanskrit, which was called Devabhasya, the language of the gods, in which a whole cross-section of a race in very ancient time gained their enlightenment via. So we come together today both as a live audience here and as a live streaming audience to look into the second class in a path called Shakta Advaita Vada. Vada means path in Sanskrit. Shakta means those worshippers of Shakti power generally seen as feminine divine wisdom or the divine mother of the universe or the goddess of non-duality. <coughs> and that word Advaita is very key also in the Shakta Advaita Vada phrase because uh, as Vivekananda says, Advaita will be the future religion of humanity. There's no doubt about that. So on all fields and gaining ground all the time is this realization of the oneness between the apparently individualized soul and the Supreme Soul. The Jivatman, which you see right there at the back of her parrot, which she's holding in one of her arms. We are the Jivatman, we are one of her little pets, mm -hmm. the, the living beings. And the Paramatman, which you see here at the crown of her head. The uh, Paramatman means the Supreme Soul, which we chanted about as being non-dual, indivisible, all-pervasive, birthless, deathless, and that's what these two entries, entries mean here. Aparinama means without transformation, and Ajativada means birthless and deathless, or without jati, birth or caste. So we look at this Advaita, this Advaitic element in all religions. For instance, Christ said, I and my Father are one. Or Lord Buddha talked about Buddha nature. Vedanta calls about, talks about this self is Brahman, or I am Atma Brahma, this self is Brahman. Or Tattvamasi, that reality thou art. There's no difference between God and mankind, uh, creature and creator, spirit and nature. Uh, the only difference you might say would be in degrees of manifestation. That is one indivisible reality which springs into many parts, many apparently individualized parts, but really always remain one in that fashion, a parinama. They don't really go through any transformation, they only seem to. The power that makes them seem to go through transformation is right there, maya, nama, rupa, desha, kala, nimitta. You were talking about that this morning at 7 a.m., 7.15 a.m. here in the ashram at the live streaming satsang, where five questions were sent in. Interesting, five questions, also five elements of maya. It's called quintuplication process. We know there are five elements, air, earth, fire, water, ether, and we know, or we should know, that they connect to our five senses. That is, smelling, tasting, seeing, touching, and hearing. And there's a direct correlation, by the way. A yogi or a yogini wants to know that right away, how to reconnect earth to smell, taste to water, and fire to sight, air to touch, and hearing to uh, uh, this uh, ether that we find ourselves in. It's like fish find themselves in water but don't know what to call it, or maybe don't even believe in its existence, although it's all around them. In the same way, we find ourselves in the ether of spirit, 
but yet we can't see it or feel it or touch it or taste it or smell it. It's beyond our senses, which is why we meditate, so we can cut down our senses, cut down time, that's kala, cut down space, desha, cut away name and form, nama and rupa, and get beyond nimitta, karma, or cause and effect. Cause and effect is binding us in, uh, an act and, we, and a reaction. Uh, we, we reap what we sow. So in that regard, we have to try and neutralize our karma and have to see beyond name and form and transcend time and space. So when you're doing that, you're transcending that queen of all four letter words called Maya. I just passed them on my friends coming down the hill and they said, what are you doing? And I said, I live stream about God twice on Sunday to the world. And what are you doing? He said, uh, we were just playing golf. And I said, do you know why they call it golf, right? And they said, no. I said, because all of their four-letter words were taken. <clears throat> but the queen of all four-letter words is this word maya. It's really impossible to understand. It's inscrutable. It's enigmatic. Uh, that's why when we find ourselves in form, with a name, we believe in the fact that we are for, with form and named. We accept our name, we accept our form. It's only the great souls who don't accept. They reject. They deny. It's a very healthy denial going on there amongst the monks, amongst the sannyasins, amongst the yogis and yoginis, amongst the spiritual aspirants, amongst the devotees of the Lord even. A very healthy denial going on which sees through name and form just taking two of those elements right now and begins to look towards a nameless, formless essence which you come upon tonight in your deep sleep state. Everyone goes formless for a few hours every 24 hour period. But nobody questions it. Where was I in deep sleep? When I wasn't waking, when I wasn't dreaming, where did I go? Where did this I go to when I went formless, you see? So everyone is denying in an unhealthy way the fact that they go formless. But the seers are denying in a healthy way that they have form and name, you see, that, that they are name and form. And living in that fact is called enlightenment. They know that it's all Brahman, but they know that it manifests at different levels. Well, this chart is really an example of how many different levels of manifestation reality can assume. That's a good word, assume. Words like non-actual, apparent, assume, uh, those words can stand in in our understanding for the word maya. Something that is impossible, yet it becomes possible. Like life, for instance. Life seems impossible when you look at it. When you look in the rest of the universe and don't find any life, and you look at this planet and its conditions, and you say, what a miracle, you see. So all of the precious human form, as we call it in my tradition, uh, is permeated with symbology, just like her form is as well. Hers is a formless form, by the way. I mean, this is only an artist's representation using a friendly image that we can all identify with, the mother. But really, she's a formless form. She's more like an energy that runs through you, but not a kinetic energy, not an electric energy, not the kind of energies we're used to thinking about in physics or in science or uh, even in, in uh, athletics, like our energy of our sports and so forth. In fact, Christ was pointing to that divine energy when he said man does not live by bread alone. It, he lives by a different kind of energy. That is, he sustains himself by an energy that is much more subtle and which cannot be divined by the senses. It has to be, the senses have to be shut down. So that's what you do in deep sleep tonight. You shut off the senses. You do it very effectively, by the way, and you're a marvelous meditator at that point. But try and meditate when you're awake. <laughs> you're not a very good meditator. Your mind thinks about every form it can possibly conjure up. It thinks about every name it can assign to things. 
and more. And it also, uh, if it begins to seek the meaning for its life, it begins to ponder things like Desha and Kala, like Einstein and others did. It begins to ponder time and space and uh, then begins to look towards a deeper grade of mantra than just, hi, how's the weather, or how are you, our everyday jargon that we use on each other. Then spiritual circles form, and people get together and they start speaking about yoga, they start speaking about Vedanta, they start speaking about Buddhism and the great philosophical schools. They look deeper into the teachings of the Christ, Moses, Abraham, Muhammad, and other great teachers, which are the founders of these world religions. And it is our, not just contention in SRV, which is this organization you find yourself with here, with its three ashrams in California, Oregon, and Hawaii. It's not just our contention, but it's our desire to share the fact that behind all of this manifestation of the world is this Divine Mother reality called Shakti. That was whom he worshipped, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who is our ideal here. And he called her Kali. And, of course, everyone from the Dakoits of India to the fat cats, rich people of Hollywood <laughs> have come up with their idea of what Kali is since he's come in 18... Uh, in the 1800s, I think it's 1836 to 1886 was his lifespan, about 50 years. And he changed the world radically just by his mere presence here. And he, of course, sent his great entourage of divine souls, Brahmanandam, Shivam, Shantam, Premarupam, Niranjanam, Yogisham, Adbhutam, Nichim, Akhandadvaita, Lakshinam, Vigyanam, Trigunatitam, Turyabeda, Samgitam, Subodham, Shardam, Chaiva, Vivekashashi, Bhushanam. That's 16 Anandas. See? They all have the last name Ananda. If someone deli developed, delivered a telegram to them, they'd be in a quandary. See? Would Mr. Ananda stand up? And 16 great souls would stand up in that room. See? So Ananda means the bliss, the bliss of the eternal self, which they have discovered, which Sri Ramakrishna revealed to them in their lives and uh, actually even beyond their lives, beyond name and form, time and space, where life takes place, is this eternal life Christ talked about. And that he wanted to reveal to the fishermen along the river so they could become fishers of men. And then people would awaken up to their true nature. So whether you look at before Christ's time, the Jews were calling her Shekinah, see, or whether you look uh, uh, even Prior to that, you'll find this Shakti word in Sanskrit being bantered about by all the philosophies. You'll find it in the mother of the Buddhas called Pragyaparamita. You'll find her there. You'll find her in Jainism. You'll find her in Sikhism. You'll find her in yoga called Chit Shakti. The father of yoga, Patanjali, called her the Chit Shakti. She's the mother of intelligence. And so when I want to try and share Shakti power with everyone, then I have to come up with something like this, you see. I have to look at all facets, as many facets of her as, as I can, so that we don't mistake her just as, say, a nature goddess. Nature comes out of her, but she's not formed of nature, you see. Uh, she's not just a goddess of philosophy and religion. In fact, some songs say that she doesn't even know the extent of her own wisdom, so vast she is. So she is what these four arms of hers in this particular representation tell us. She's will, she's spontaneous activity, she's a producer of substances, and she's wisdom. Icha, Kriya, Dravya, and Jnanam. Those are her four arms her uh, four sub-shaktis, you might say. So there's the great Mahashakti here. You also see her on our altar as Mother Kali and as Mother Durga. And you also see her in her human form as Sri Sharda Devi there, whom we worship and whom five million other people worship now in the world. Gaining ground very fast, this path of Divine Mother and the representatives of Divine Mother that have come amongst us 
That's why we called SRV, Sharda Ramakrishna Vivekananda, spell serve, by the way. So in this series of five classes, we're going to, or is it seven classes, we're going to serve you with the helping of Divine Mother Reality. And so you should know that key word, Shakti or Mahashakti. Now, last week, at our first of these series of classes, we looked into Brahman, right there at the very tip of her crown. Brahman is the word for divine reality, non-dual reality. It's nameless, formless, timeless, spaceless, deathless, so it's beyond its own maya. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, the poison exists in the snake but the snake doesn't die. So he's talking about Brahman and its Maya. Another time we talked about um, the snake and its wriggling motion. Sometimes the snake is still, other times it wriggles across the floor, or hopefully not the floor of your house, let's say across the ground. So that means Brahman is, the snake in its static mode is Brahman. It doesn't move. It doesn't need to because it's everywhere. And the snake in its wriggling motion is Shakti. That is, it can break into divine power. Now, this very pregnant saying of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa explains all the enigma and all the problem that philosophies have been and religions have been arguing about for time out of mind. Is God formless or does God have form? Does God move or is God static? Is it dynamic or is it static? It's both. And so that's why I started off chanting. Vedanta, Siddhanta, Nirukti, Resha. Vedanta, it's the Siddhanta of Vedanta, the conclusion of the Vedantic school, which is called Ashtaka school, here in this pillar, that all of this is Brahman. Not only the formless nature, which you cannot see, taste, touch, hear, and smell, but name, form, time, space, and causality also fall within the pale of Brahman's periphery. There is nothing that is not in Brahman. It exists in everything and everywhere but it's not a thing and it's not a location. So then great seers approach this non-dual reality by looking at name and form and saying, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. You know what I'm saying? Neti Neti is the famous school in Vedanta that says, not this, not this, not this. You weed your garden until you find out what is. In order to know what is, you have to get through all of what is not. See? So you go through everything that changes, everything that has a name, everything that has a form, everything that's mutable, everything that goes through phases of time, everything that transforms, apparently or otherwise, and you weed your garden of that. And when you get done with all that process, which happens in your mind, then you find what is left over is that reality. That's the only thing that hasn't changed. And you find out that all these things were sublations or modifications or manifestations, or if you want to be kind, expressions over reality. Just like when you wake up from deep sleep tonight, you came out of the formless light. When you were born this lifetime, you came out of the formless light. But when you came out of the formless light, you superimposed the form over the light, and the light got obscured. Or it got distorted. You took a little of that light, played with it, and turned it into a form. See? No, no, you can't do that. You can only dream that. You can't actually do that. So dream power of the absolute, that's what she's called. She makes the impossible possible. She makes the formless, nameless Brahman seem to have name and form. <laughs> she makes the static reality dance. And that's why we love her. But usually what we're loving is not her in essence. We're usually loving all her plays, all her forms, all her machinations, all her sleight of hand. See, we love that and we get hypnotized by it, and we get drawn out by it. You know what out means, out the senses to the objects. And the seers say the romance between the senses and their objects has to stop. And because when, when the senses fell in love with the objects, 
They forgot their connection. The eye forgot its connection with sight. The ear forgot its connection with sound. The tongue forgot its connection with taste. All of the five elements became separate entities, separate gods and goddesses. That's why religion in its early stage worships them. Agni, the fire, the god of fire, Varuna, the god of water, Vayu, the god of air. Or go to Rome or Greece or any other tradition, you'll find out that they each have a name for the five elements as gods. God of fire, god of earth, god of wind, so forth and so on. That's a rudimentary form of religion. That's a starting place. And if you're an American nowadays and you've fallen so far away from relationship with nature, then that's a good place to pick up. It's a good place to start. I, ho I hope nobody in this room has fallen away from those realizations, but worldly people and certainly evil people have fallen away from those connections. Otherwise, they wouldn't be treating her elements so irreverently. They would be treating everything with reverence. See? Now, her elements are right there. Manifested Prakriti, or Pancha Bhutas. They're at the very foundation of everything, like the Muladharas at the base of the spine. Down there, out there, you see, where everything is congealed, where thought has congealed into forms. That's what's happened in the, in the case of the five elements, because every object is made of a combination of the five elements in different degrees. Every element has a little water in it, has a little fire in it, has probably a lot of earth in it, and it's shot through and through with ether. Ether holds it all. So if you were to study the five elements after first connecting them to your senses, you'd have solid grounds for meditation. Why are people not making progress in meditation? Why are Westerners falling off into Hatha Yoga, falling off into breathing exercises, but not having any really powerful spiritual experiences, and definitely not having samadhi? We'll talk about that there, because here's samadhi, nirvikalpa and salvikalpa, two kinds of samadhi. One is beyond form, which is rare, Almost no one has it. And the other is Savikalpa with form or with time. Those are the higher experiences in time, according to these schools. So if you're a, a Westerner, an American, or even a person of this day and age, and you've fallen far, far away from the connections, if you've lost the trail of breadcrumbs back inside of you, and you cannot find your way home, then there's a good starting place for you. Let's start with the five elements and connect them to the five senses. And then meditate on what happens. You have to sit a while and ponder this. See? Because you're making a connection, and when you make a connection, just like putting two wires together, a certain power happens. Well, there's the first sign of Shakti. It's called prana. Prana is right there. Right at her navel, you see. Prana is the third chakra, basically. Prana is where the fetus is born. What happens prenatally? The soul is outside or inside somewhere and it's looking for a form. And so eventually it will connect there in that chakra with uh, the fetus. It'll choose its parents, either consciously or ignorantly, or a combination thereof. Some people are good choosers, some people are not so good choosers. Some people are attracted to higher things. Some people are attracted to lower things. When a camel dies, it's going to be attracted to camel parents again. Why? Because the camel eats thorny bushes and loves to taste. So when its camel soul, so to speak, leaves its camel body, it still has a desire for thorny bushes. That's why there's so many camels being born, by the way and so many cows and horses and so forth. Trees, the desire of the tree is in its seed. So everything is based on this desire and Shakti has to come along and satisfy this desire in us. Why? So that we can keep having fun and keep suffering in rounds? No, so that we can transcend Maya and get beyond name, form, time, space, and cause and effect and karma, realize our true nature and come home. You can even do that while you're in the body, by the way, according to this tradition. 
you can get jivan mukta. It's a living, liberated state of enlightenment while you're in the body. It's a very high state. You might not have seen too many jivan muktas around, walking around in your life. See? I saw one in my teacher. So I bowed down to him and apprenticed him, took initiation, and have been working for 40 years on what he taught me. Now I'm sharing it with you. When I first met him, he said, when I first met my teacher, I hadn't heard of God as mother. But then I heard him calling God mother. Now I call God mother. So what we're saying here, in effect, is it's very difficult to reach your formless state of samadhi. You don't have any fingernail holds up that cliff. You see, if you go formless, it's like death. And if you're attacked, if you're attached to life still, death is not an option for you. You're cling to life. You see. So you're going to have to brave death, dive into the waters, and 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 suck the whole ocean in. You see, As there's a song that says. Uh, oh, Mother, if you won't reveal yourself, I will dive into the oceans of existence of death and I will drink the waters of death. So you're going to have to go beyond death and see it as one of Mother's powers. Death is simply a power of transition from one state to another. When you see that, then you'll be fearless. And then you can sing. Abai pade pran sho pechi ami abai pade pran sho pechi ami ar and so forth and so on i have uh, opened up my heart and shown the wish fulfilling tree that's growing there planted by a seed given to me by my guru now I cannot, now death will not bother me anymore. I will show him Kali existing in my heart. See, Beautiful songs they sing about this non-dual realization that they've gotten via, via going through these various purificatory practices, like connecting the senses with the elements and meditating on, on the result. See, You can't just come to a class and hear somebody speak, find words, and then go away and say, that was great. You have to go home and practice it yourself. You have to try out these things. Otherwise, you could become fascinated with another level of her maya called scripture. But you have to go beyond scripture too. We were saying this morning, Vivekananda said, we have to take people beyond the Quran, beyond the Bible, beyond the Gita. But we can't do it by throwing out the Quran, the Bible, and the Gita. We have to study them, know them, and then transcend them. Use the wisdom in them to get to a transcendent position. Because words, philosophies, are just another form of her maya. They're just higher maya, you see. So you want to follow this process through to the ultimate state. If you're continuing here at this chakra, being born and born again and again with your ancestors, that's precisely what Buddha wanted out of when he sat under the bow tree for 49 days. You have to transcend that chakra and, and hear the Om. You see, the word sounds right here. Anahata is this chakra. That's a word for the for Om. Anahata sound. You see, Anahata Dvani. Uh, then you become a devotee of the Lord. You become struck with the wonder of everything, and you'll never go back again to the world to the conventional world, to the mundane world. You're lost to the world. It can't find you anymore. You're transparent to it. So this march of consciousness, inward and upward, it's called the seven chakra systems, is their kundalini system, kundalini shakti and the chakras. It's one of the great mysterious philosophies of India, kundalini shakti. I just completed a book about it called Reclaiming Kundalini Yoga. Reclaiming it from those who are using it just as an exercise for food fadism and breathing and so forth. Reclaim it and set it up as a system for 
that, that belongs to her that will awaken each of these divine centers right up the elevator, see, right up to the top floor of this marvelous human structure. And to awaken that energy is going to take some charging up of the thoughts. Shama Christ used to say that. Charge up the chitta. You see? Charge up the chitta. The chitta means your thoughts. He said, if you don't, then thoughts become like rainwater, and they, f they seek the lowest place to settle. You might have noticed that about rainwater. But if you charge up the thoughts, they'll become like a hot air balloon, and you won't be able to keep your mind down anymore. He used to come out of this samadhi in the 1800s, and he'd go like this, come down, mother, come down. And he'd hit the top of his head, see, so that this energy would leave the realm of formlessness, begin to see a little bit of what form is about, and then come down to the realm of expression of form and into the drawing room of God right here where divine form is but he wouldn't go any lower than that she wouldn't come into the realms of eating drinking and sex life he would always play at the fourth to seventh chakra he said about that I run a boat race between the fourth and the seventh chakra all the time my consciousness runs a boat race see? so where is he in any given time when you see a great soul like this see? where is he or she See, they're lost, lost, lost in divine splendor within them. You can't call them out. They're not aware of the body and senses anymore. Where did they go? Sort of where you went in deep sleep, when you left your body and your senses. Only they're doing it consciously and you're not. See. So that's why Vedanta says everyone has the Atman in it. That's the good news of Vedanta. Vedanta doesn't believe in hell or eternal damnation or a seven-day creation theory, so to speak. It believes in the eternal perfection of the soul, that you cannot create a soul. A soul is not creatable. A soul is eternal. That's why they call it, read my lips, the eternal soul. <laughs> you might have wondered. They don't call it the soul that's born and dies. So how can you create a soul? It's a create. So that's the good news, that a create soul that non-dual soul that's not subject to maya, birth, death, disease, grow, uh, maya, name, form, time, space, and causality, or as I was just uh, jumping ahead, is not subject to birth, growth, disease, old age, decay, and death. That soul cannot experience those. The body experiences those. The body-mind mechanism experiences those in nature. But this eternal soul is not made of nature. It doesn't have a form. It's unnameable. It's beyond karma and cause and effect. You, therefore, you have to raise yourself to it. Vivekananda used to say, there are two tendencies in the human being. One, to drag God down to earth, and the other is to raise oneself up to God. Unfortunately, most people take the first route, he says. <laughs> We try and make God amenable to our comfort zones. You see, oh, this is God, that is God, my child's God, the angels are God, anything with form is God. And these are all dream forms that we're conjuring up and we're assigning God to them, you see. But the real truth of the matter is that we should be raising ourselves up to this formlessness. Up means in, inward ascension. We should be experiencing and tasting the bliss of ourself. And this is what the great souls have been doing for millennia, for ages. And coming back again and again to tell us that that's what we should be doing. If you can do that, you're, off, you're better off here. You're fine here. It's not like you have to transcend or leave the body in order to have realization of your true nature. The ideal is Jivan Mukta, that you should live here in the form, in perfect recognition and realization of your true nature as being timeless, deathless, birthless, faultless, eternally perfect. See? Get a hold of that side of yourself. Meditate on that Atman or Buddha nature or Tathagatagarbha. Get into Satori or Samadhi or Koivalya. See? Get into a high state. Realize your true self. Be free. And then share that freedom with others. 
That's what she told us when she was alive, my teacher's teacher, Holy Mother. She said, oh children, you have been given the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, your problems are all over. Now, on your way to God, won't you just turn and help others a little bit? Put off your moksha a little while so that you can help convince others of the eternal nature of their divine self. That the soul is not finite, it's infinite. So you're going to have to convince them of the infinite nature, not the finite nature of reality. Finite means changing. Changing means nature, form, matter. You don't want to be left in that condition, you see, at the end of your life. Nor will you be very well off living in that kind of presumption, you see, that I am a material girl living in a material world. That's not a very good mantra. That's going to leave you with birth, growth, disease, old age, decay, and death. And what you want is your eternal nature. Once you have that, you have everything. That's why he said, seek thee first, and all else will be added unto thee. Separate the wheat from the chaff. So that's what discrimination and Vivica and detachment, Vairagya, those are those two gems in her crown. Vivekananda was naming himself after that. I am the bliss of discrimination between the wheat and the chaff, you see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> between the form and the formlessness. Between eternal life and transformation of death. Between the essential and the non-essential, I am that discrimination. I will stand as that distinction between the real and the unreal. Nitya, anitya, vastu, viveka. That's where that word finds its home, you see. Nitya, the eternal. Anitya, the non-eternal. Vastu, the difference between vivekananda, discrimination. I have the discrimination of knowing the difference between the real and the unreal between the changing and the unchanging. And once I found that out, then I became immortal, which is what I am anyway. I put the final nails in the coffin of death. My teacher used to say, you make doubt, doubt itself. You make fear, afraid of itself. You put death in its own grave. <laughs> How's that for a mantra? Even in English. So that's what we talked about last week, much of it having to do with the eternal reality, Brahman, and Atman. Now, the, remember the chart on Brahman we talked about last week? Sakshi, being a witness of phenomena. Antaryami, coming to know the eternal ruler, immortal, seated in your heart, meditating in your heart on your ishtam. I've meditated for over 40 years on Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother in my heart. That's my ishtam. I, get, I got the mantra for them. So I meditate in my heart upon them, and I silently repeat the mantra with their name in it for 40 years, nonstop. So that's called focusing on your ishtam, see, uh, and uh, using the mantra. Mm, it's all there, too. Mantra's here at her throat. And Ishtam is here, Ishvara and Avatar, by this lamp. And there's the Guru and the disciple, Guru Shishya. Brahma Gyan and Prema Bhakti, the highest wisdom and the most ecstatic love are those two lamps, lighting the way, you see, lighting up her beautiful features. So we talked about Sakshi, we talked about Antaryami, we talked about Pratyagatman, the Supreme Soul. And we talked about the Kutasta, remember that? The four levels of Brahman, if Brahman has levels. These are four designations. Kutasta means there's an underlying substratum for everything. A dancer must have a stage. If the stage weren't there, the dancer couldn't dance. So all of this is a great dance, but it needs to have a foundation upon which it moves. That foundation is Brahman. 
They call that kutasta. You don't have to believe in God or disbelieve in God. You just have to say, kutasta, there is a foundation for everything. You don't have to be an atheist or an agnostic or a believer in God to practice many of these systems, especially the Gnostica ones. Buddhism doesn't necessarily believe in God. Samkhya doesn't necessarily believe in God. Patanjali hardly mentioned God in his yoga system. Both Astaka and Nastika are fairly non-committal about the existence of God. As if here we've been arguing for thousands of years in the West about whether God exists or not, and they started off on the footing that God is existence. See, you can't deny your own existence. You can go denying everything, but you can't deny the, the existence of the one who's doing the denying, can you? See? So that's how subtle this kutasta is. It's a foundation for everything. You can't deny it. Even if you deny it in deep sleep tonight, you still come out back out of deep sleep and take this all on again. Where did it come from? And where does it go? Maybe it's not being created and destroyed. Maybe it's actually being projected and then withdrawn. <laughs> see. What a novel idea, you see. Maybe there is no such thing as creation and destruction. Maybe the seers of India are right. Maybe it's just all a mental projection, plays for a while, and withdraws itself, and nothing happens. No birth, no death. And if you sat looking at the ocean, that's what the ocean would tell you. Oh, I play for a while with my waves, and then they, they, they get sucked back into a hollow, and then they come back up and play as a wave again. But nothing happens to the ocean. Shri Krishna used to say, the leaves from a tree fall in the temple yard, fall in the street, fall in the gutter, fall in the sewer, or fall in the schoolyard. It doesn't make any difference to the tree where its leaves fall. So start looking for that underlying substratum and focus your mind on that. Don't focus your mind on problems, on brooding. It's a waste of time. You want the bliss of yourself. And the bliss of yourself will color everything else blissful. Or if you can't reach bliss yet, how about the peace of yourself? Attain the peace of yourself, then everything else will be colored peaceful. But if you can attain Brahman through Nirvikalpa Samadhi, everything's colored Brahman. That's like putting on yellow glasses, Sri Ramakrishna said. Well, now Brahman, now everything is Brahman, you see. It's all colored Brahman. So getting that highest realization is like having this special pair of glasses. You might say a monocle, not a bifocal. You put it in front of your third eye, not in front of your two eyes, you see. That's a very special kind of glasses which makes everything colored Brahman. It's everything colored Allah, everything colored Almighty Father. That's my memory of what we just what, what we looked at last week. Now, we also looked at the that was in terms of Brahman. We also looked at the six complements of the Paramatman, right? And uh, we found out that the Atman was all these things I've been saying, birthless and deathless, eternal, all-pervasive. That's you we're talking about. You could say, you know, maybe not your body, but if you see that your body is made of the same things that other bodies are made of, then isn't your body also all-pervasive? You could die, but another will take your place tree will fall but another will grow and its leaves will fall into different courtyards see there is no end to anything it's just all eternity if you're looking for middles beginnings and ends you better read his book Sri Krishna called the Bhagavad Gita because then he'll convince you there's no such thing as middles beginnings and ends there's just eternity and you can be in eternity or you can be in eternity's cycles there's the difference you see if you're in eternity, it's like deep sleep tonight. But if you're in its cycles, it's like waking and dreaming, waking and dreaming, waking and dreaming, and never knowing yourself as formless. People have this outright fear about going formless. Do they fear going to sleep tonight? 
do they fear being in peace? Or do they fear the mind not thinking? Not brooding? Certainly not. Well, that's called sattva. Right here. Prakasha, vikshepa, and avarani. Uh, prakasha means uh, sattva guna. It means revelatory power. And everyone experiences it. Even the biggest fool occasionally has a high moment. See? Where his mind is all of a sudden balanced and he says, Hey, Tala, this is great, man. This feels cool. Nothing's wrong with this picture. Then, all of a sudden, restlessness comes, Bhikshepa, and then dullness comes, Avarana, covering power. Then the dumb brute, you know, reverts to the dumb brute, you see. Or the restless fool. We were talking about the six complements of the Atman, how it's eternal, birthless, deathless, all pervasive, and how we looked at that last week. So with a bit of review from last week's class, we can now launch into a few of the newer subjects or the other subjects that are found upon this chart. Now, I thought first that we would re-quote or re-read this sloka at the top of the chart. When everything melts away, it is then that pralaya comes. Pralaya is a word for dissolution. So it's a good word to bring up now because deep sleep tonight is a kind of pralaya. If everyone were to go into deep sleep at the same time, probably the worlds would disappear. In other words, since the world is set up that half is sleeping and half is waking, and then the world turns and sun and moon and so forth, and the other wake and those go to sleep, then we always have this consciousness, somebody's always awake to the waking state, you see. But if everything goes in, if everyone went into deep sleep at the same time, we'd have a kind of pralaya, dissolution of all name and form. Maya would, would fade to the background, which is precisely what happens when you go into samadhi. Maya just shows itself up to be illusory and goes away. And the souls, the seers, have found a good way of coming back to the world and skirting maya. In other words, when they come back and they take on name and form, like the rest of us, they don't take it on in actuality. They take it on only apparently. In other words, they don't identify with the form. They only associate with it. And so they're always keeping it forefront in their mind the fact that they are not the body, they're not the mind, and they're not the prana, and they're not the senses and so forth, not the objects. So they are able to visit the realm, the realm of name and form uh, in full identity of their true self, like having that tainted glasses on, those colored glasses on, you see, seeing everything as reality. And that's where that chant I started out chanting this morning comes from. Basically, uh, that Vedanta, the conclusion of Vedanta, that all this is Brahman. They come back and see all this as Brahman, but we come out of deep sleep and we see all of this as just variegated objects in nature. In other words, we see some light in deep sleep, but we forget it when we come out here. They see the light in Samadhi, they don't forget it when they come here. They see this is all a reflection of it, but the ordinary person forgets the presence of Brahman and sees the object forgets God and sees man. The ignorant call God man. But the wise uh, know that man is God, walking around on two legs. That's how Vivekananda put it. He came here to the West, early 1900s. Oh, I see, none of you have realized that man is just God walking around on two legs. You haven't realized that yet. We've known that in our country for thousands of years. We just happened to have forgotten it lately, like everyone else. You see, in this yuga, this Kali yuga, this age of darkness. That is, uh, so my idea about pralaya uh, is, um, is that it's a kind of dissolution that doesn't have to happen after 4 billion and three, 320 million year cycles. It can actually happen right away. You can go into pralaya. It's a kind of absence of name and form. And you can initiate this consciously if, if you have the wherewithal to do so. Otherwise, you can just leave it to chance and just 
visited in deep sleep every 24 hours for a few hours, that's all. But you won't know what's going on. You won't know the dynamics. You won't know that you just visited the kingdoms of heaven within you and you came back out to the outer kingdom. You won't know my father's mansion has many chambers and you're in the outer, outermost chamber right now, but that tonight you go into the inner chambers on your way to deep sleep, on your way to formlessness. So the dynamics of form to formless, formlessness to form and back from form to formlessness are unknown to us, see, unless we become enlightened about the matter <clears throat> and begin to meditate on it. So with that as a preamble, let's take this quote. When everything melts away, it is then that pralaya, dissolution, comes. At that time, I abide, she's talking herself in her scripture, Srimad Devi Bhagavatam it's called. At that time, I abide with Brahman, latent in it. So she goes back into the supreme form out of which she issues. When the, world, when the worlds are projected again in a new cycle, I become Sri, abundance, Bhuti, intelligence, Dritti, Shmriti, Shraddha, Medha, Daya, Lajya, Kshuda, Trishna, Kshama, Akshama, Nidra, so forth and so on, and I become Para, Pashanti, Madhyama, and Vaikari, and I flow through the 35 millions of nerves located in the sacred human form. That's a big, it's a great quote from the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, which has thousands of quotes like that. This is her scripture. There are two mother scriptures in the world. I mean, you have to realize, in India, mother has her own religion. In the rest of the world, oh, a little bit of mother in Catholicism, a little bit of mention of mother in Judaism, a little bit of mention of mother in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. But in India, she has her whole religion to herself. She is seen as the mother of all religions, in fact. That's why they call India the mother of all religions, you see. So if you read two of her quintessential scriptures, one's called the Chandi, which is shorter, and then you have the uh, Bhaga, uh, the um, Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, then you'll find great quotes like that, just waiting to be plucked, you see, and meditated upon. So in just one sentence there, or two sentences, she's running a whole gamut of truth at you. So the portion of that I want to concentrate on goes to this chart. And this goes in accordance with the word Om. And this word, Hrim. Now we talked a little bit about the word this morning at Satsang live streaming. Most of us know in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. That's what Jesus told John, and John didn't know what the hay he was saying, basically. And so he had to go to Gethsemane in the garden and meditate because Christ wanted him to know that everything is founded on the word. What Christ didn't want was that his whole religion be based in the word. That's called origins. He knows, like Sri Krishna, that reality is originless. In other words, it doesn't have a beginning, middle, and end. It just seems to. That the real truth is a parinama. Transformationless. Everything that Brahman is transformationless, it does not go through changes. It's one static, homogenous mass of pure conscious awareness. Shall I repeat that? One static mass, indivisible mass of pure conscious awareness. Try and imagine it. Better yet, try to envision it because it's not just an imagination, it's a reality. It's not just a reality, it's the reality. We have to get beyond this silly argument, oh, you have your reality and I have my reality. If there were two realities, they would cancel each other out. So there is the reality only, and we are in it, always, like fish are in water, not knowing it. And birds are in air, not knowing it. See? Like we blink 100,000 times, you see? every few hours but don't know it. It's that subtle. So this Brahman, which we call it in our tradition, has words like Allah and Almighty Father and Pragyaparam in other religions. 
is that underlying foundation substratum for everything. It's changeless, it's transformationless. So what is the instigator of all transformation it has to be right there in the beginning was the Word. And it was with God, probably better to say with Goddess in this case, and it was God. You can hardly discern the difference between God and His Word, between Mother and her Word. They're so much the same. So we have to go to a system like Kundalini Shakti that tells us about this eye. See? Now, in my research of this eye, I found it mentioned in seven different religions. I have a chart on that, as you pr might expect. I like to chart these territories, and I'm not a listless person. I have lots of lists to give you. So this wisdom eye, Jnana Chakshu is what Krishna called it. If thine eye be single, thou shalt know the truth. That's how Christ spoke about it. I have within me the Dharma eye. That's how Buddha spoke about it. And I can go on. The Tao speaks about it. Uh, the white dove ascending, the Gnostic Christians. There are so many references to this single eye. And so if you see a poster with an eye there, don't laugh at it. See, Or don't think it looks strange because it's symbolic of the all-seeingness, which is called omniscient. Now, if you wanted to spell it differently, you could say omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. You see. If the om is even in English, isn't it? In English words. So if you spell it om, it's okay, but you're missing the u of om when you spell it om. A is for creation, U is for preservation, and M is for destruction. Or the way we put it in Vedanta is A is for projection, U is for sustenance, M is for withdrawal. Isn't that what's happening all the time everywhere? Projection, sustenance, and withdrawal. A thing manifests itself forth, plays for a while, and disappears. But that's not the end of it. It comes back again. Time comes back again. Time is a circle. It's not a flat line. And that's called a cycle. And that cycle is called samsara in Buddhism. If you get caught in it, then you get caught in it with your ancestors for hundreds and thousands of lifetimes, they say. Why not? It's been going on at least two, three thousand, four thousand years in our own history that we can record. Or is there any evidence to say that it hasn't been going on for thousands and thousands of years prior to that? And where is it going on is the, port, is the important point. It's going on in you. This word is sounding in you. You can hear it by going into meditation. In fact, if you retain your consciousness to the very last second before you fall asleep tonight, you will hear it come and take over everything like a big rush, like a big hum, like a thousand bumblebees just invaded your head just before you went to sleep. And everything turned into the bliss of the word. And you went back into pralaya. You willingly went into a formless state. It was blissful. Like a moth goes to flames, you went there. And when you woke up, you said, I feel great. But if you dreamed all night, you wake up and you say, I don't feel very good. You see, Some of my dreams were good. Some were mixed. Some were nightmarish. Some of them I remember, some of them I don't. Whatever the case may be, you're playing with form, just like you're doing here. But in deep sleep, you don't play with form. You go formless. And so that kind of pralaya is what she's talking about. Now, she describes it in the tradition as the four, in four stages. And that's what the chart, the live streaming audience is probably seeing this chart right now. Let me call up my own copy of it. And before the break, we can look at it a little bit. Basically, it has four phases. It's called para, pashanti, vaikari, and maidyama and vaikari, she mentions here. She becomes those states. She accompanies them. So she brings form out of formlessness with her four arms, will, action, intelligence, and don't forget substances. She can actually produce substances. The mind can produce substances. So substances don't just get created out of nothing or 
in nature. They're actually thoughts first, and then they turn, then they manifest themselves in nature. It's it's sort of like the inventor first thinks of the gadget, and then he puts it into nature, right? He puts it into form. So it had its inception in his mind first. That's like this stage, you see. Everything has its inception in the great mind first, before the actual object comes into being. Now, if you start to follow this train of thinking, beware, because you're going to have to abandon creation theory and evolution. Those aren't going to make any sense to you anymore once you look into the great thoughts of the Vedas and the Upanishads. All of a sudden you say, now that's what I've been looking to see all my life. That makes sense. And it's not that the seven-day creation theory, if you take it symbolically, and the 4,320,000,000-year evolutionary theory of the scientists doesn't make sense. It's that it's incomplete. It doesn't provide for that pure, indivisible mass of pure conscious awareness, does it? It doesn't take into account its own intelligence. And it's not connecting its own intelligence with all of this. It's not looking at the tree and saying, that's just a form of my mind. I thought tree, and tree happened. It's not saying that, is it? It's saying the tree grew in nature, and nature is accepted over billions of years after a big bang. It's all physical, you see. I have to attribute it all to the physical. I'm just a material scientist living in a material world, you see, is what you're saying at that point. And you're not providing for any other eventuality whatsoever, even in theory. See, that's how closed the door is. But if you can all of a sudden jump to this idea that objects are just mind made manifest, that the whole world came out of mind, or if you prefer, out of the word, then it will all of a sudden make sense to you why there is no birth and why there's no death for anything. And why origins is not a complete enough package to help heal your doubts. You have to know about eternity. You have to know that everything is. That's probably one of the sweetest two-word mantras in the world. Sarvosmi. Everything is. Or if you want to put it the way one of my favorite physicist friends has on his teacher, nothing is not. You can put it op oppositely, you see. Nothing is not. There is no such thing as nothing. There's always something. It's just that that something went formless on you, you see. And therefore you looked at it and it wasn't there anymore, you see. Where did that glass go? Somebody put a glass here a little while ago and I drank out of it. See, now it's gone. So if I say the glass was there, that's like saying God is there. I have an idea that the glass was there, then the glass exists. If, if it wasn't ever there, then I would doubt it, you see. So we've all seen God. We see God every night in deep sleep. It's called light, or it's called sound. The mystics hear the sound. The visionaries see the light. But everyone is a party to it because that's what they're made of, light. Your intelligence, especially when it gets very well honed, is nothing but light, nothing but revelation, prakasha. It reveals everything to you like suns do. And in fact, the suns have come out of your head too. Billions of suns in the night sky have all come out of thoughts. You might as well say, each one of those great bright burning orbs in the sky has come out of my head. This has become my thought process. A great thought turned into a sun and lit up the whole universe. There's now a sun, evidently, that takes you 11 centuries to get around in a jet. Imagine that how big a, a star that is, 11 centuries in a jet to get around it? That's what they're saying. So who had that great thought? <laughs> Whose thought is that? I'd like to meet that person. See. So point here is that there is a spilling out of the highest consciousness into intelligence, and from intelligence into potential for form, and from potential to form into actual form itself. That's why when we study her forearms in another class, we'll be able to put it in, uh, see some of the dynamics of that process. Now, let's just look at it quickly before our break. Para, 
She says, I am para, prashanti, madhyama, and vaikari, right? That's in her own scripture. So this chart I was able to pull out of the tantric teachings to, to explain to you what the om is, what the word really is, what its potential is. And it is all potential, by the way. When it's in its Brahman state, when the word was with God, when om is with Brahman, and you can't tell the difference between the two, that's called para. When the word was with God, then it becomes Pishanti. So in the beginning, the word was with God, right? So that means you can't tell the difference between Shakti, the dynamic power, and Brahman. You talk about the snake and its wriggling motion, now there's no snake anymore. See? Both the snake and its wriggling motion are gone. This is a supreme state. It's evinced or evidenced by your deep sleep state tonight. You have to try and remember what your deep sleep state was like and get back there consciously is actually what you're doing when you meditate. People think they're doing all sorts of things when they meditate, but what they're really essentially doing is to dissolve themselves back into that deep sleep-like state that they experience peace in, peace and bliss. And uh, truth, non-dual truth. So this para essential state here is pure knowledge which abides as Atman. See, there's the word in that chart. Formless form of Mahashakti. Now I told you that she is really a formless form. So here's where that idea comes from. They call her Purnahanta, I in fullness. When the I, the supreme I, breaks down all its divisions and all these forms and names go away and all barriers dissolve, then that is I in fullness, Purnahanta. That's what the tantrists say. In other words, you think you're separate from him, and he thinks he's separate from her, and so forth and so on. We think we're separate from each other's country, but when all those barriers break down, conscious-wise, in consciousness, I'm not talking about on the physical planet, because that's never going to happen, except occasionally, momentarily. When that happens in your actual consciousness state, then all barriers fall away. It's just like, uh, like having a lot of uh, water and dropping a lot of different vessels in it all connected to one string and they all the, the all vessels all partition off the water right so you've got all these different partitions of water there just lift that partition and water becomes one with water again so the eye the ego eye the rascally eye causes these separations causes these divisions Lord Vashishta actually calls it the separate eye maker it would be sort of like having a lot of dough and a couple, bunch of cookie cutters. See? The dough is consciousness. We're all that. But the cookie cutter comes around and makes us look like we're different forms and different names. And we actually start believing that we're different forms and different names. And the play of Maya is afoot, you see. We can't see the oneness in everything. We can't see the God in one another or the goddess in each other. Husband and wife can't come together in a divine union. See, they're always at odds. The sexes are at odds. Everything's at odds. It's called the world. It's called relativity. But it's not the case in truth, in consciousness. The case is I in fullness. So I hope I've made this state of para fairly clear to you. It has to be experienced, of course, rather than just talked about. But think about all barriers falling away and separate partitions of water becoming one with water immediately. Like if all of a sudden the oceans rose, all seven of them, and all land was gone away. It would be one body of water. That would be I in fullness. And would the countries that got emerged, submerged, and would the fish and the animals, they would all also be a part of the ocean still, wouldn't they? So everything goes back into the indeterminate state of supreme bliss, para. Now that is in the beginning, so to speak. How, what could Christ tell John? He couldn't really say, there's no beginnings, John. So he had to say, you know, you have to understand how cycles go about. That's what Buddha was teaching his disciples. You have to understand that cycles are samsara. Buddha nature has no, sam has no cycles. It's free of samsara. It's free of suffering. You have to experience it. And then become fishers of men, see, he say. So, out of this static, stationary, imperishable state comes the Pashanti. Now, Pashanti is that stage of the word which is 
the realm of pure ideas. We were just talking about how suns are physical representations of pure ideas, great ideas. Well, Vivekananda has told us that if a man or woman, a great man or a great woman comes to earth and thinks great thoughts, that those thoughts have a origin and then they go out as vibration and they will affect humanity over time. Some may take longer, some may take, may come swifter, but that all depends upon the resistance of collective, of the collective mind. If they're open and receptive to those great ideas, swift growth will be made. If they're resistant to those, resistant to those great ideas, then no growth will show, maybe for centuries. Until a great soul comes along, then everything quickens, you see. So, intelligence at the plane of pure ideas is called pashanti, or transcendent. It's undifferentiated unity still, though. Uh, there's where, remember we were talking about om and hrim being bijams, seeds. This morning at satsang we were talking about seed syllables that are very powerful. That's her bijam, hrim, and that's Brahman's bijam, om. This is the bijam of formlessness, and this is the bijam of dynamic power. Spiritual transformation, that's the word in Sanskrit that signifies spiritual transformation. Om Hrim. So, uh, you might say Hrim kicks in about here because there's a potential being developed for form here, for name and form. The game's afoot. Here, there was no game. Now there's a bare semblance of ideas coming into that great mind. And that means a vibration. So now we're talking about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It was God, but now it's with God. It, as it were, separates itself and begins to generate things. How? By vibration. Everything happens by vibration. All objects are just subatomic particles vibrating at a billionth of a second. That's how quick they change. But we can't see that change because our senses are limited. Our, sem our senses are tuned down so slow that they see gross things. They congeal grossly. They see gross objects, trees, planets, flowers. So our senses are tuned very dimly, very grossly. They're imperfect. They're outgoing only. But if thine eye becomes single and that begins to look inward, then you begin to see the origins of things. Eventually you'll see that there is no origin to anything. It has seemed to be an origin at first, but now you're going beyond origins. That's called revelation. You see, that's the Prakashi Shakti has just revealed her, her supreme secret to you, that all name and form and time and space based in karma is Maya. And you are Atman. You're up here. Maya's down here. You see. Now, there you see an Om sign created out of Bijams. That's about the only way I could really put it in a visual. This is the Om sign of India in Sanskrit. There you see waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and Turiya. Turiya means beyond waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. The Om is made of so many bijams. I mean, you could sing them if you wanted. Vishalakshi Kali Devi Lalita Narayani Kumuda Prachandra Vishva Kama Kama Charini Om Aim Hrim Shrim Klim Krim Devi Maha Devi Nama Om are all bijams. These are these things. These little seeds that everything's made up of. Well, you think that everything's just made up of atomic particles? You haven't seen the atomic particle yet. You haven't seen the intelligent particle that gives existence to the atomic particle. This is where physics ends and metaphysics begins. And where metaphysics ends and, in, and true spirituality begins beyond religion that's where these stages begin to affect the mind. See, 
you're going into a state of objects to ideas, from ideas to subtle ideas, and from subtle ideas to formlessness, and back out again. The word is also, is always generating. The Tantras say, nobody sounds the word. It sounds itself, and it sounds eternally. So we're to believe then, and this is verified by Sri Ramakrishna's experience. He says so in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. He said, when I first came upon the Om inside of myself, I saw that all the worlds were being generated out of it, and they were also being drawn back into it. And no time was passing. No time was passing. So you see how name, form, time, space, and causality, if that gets a hold of the mind, it begins to believe that time is real. Time is an illusion. You can prove it to yourself in a coma. Prove it to yourself in a deep sleep tonight. Think about it. It's not linear. It's not even real. It's an illusion. So this word sounds eternally, and as it sounds, Everything is sustained. And it takes your consciousness put together with the word to discern this. If your consciousness becomes aware of the word, then it sees Shristi Rahasya, the secret of all creation. The Tantrasis call that secret of all creation. That is that nothing is ever created, it's only projected by vibration. And that vibration plays for a while and withdraws itself. Think of a bell. You sound the bell, the sound is there, it decays, then where does dies away, right? But the sound is still back in the bell, right? It originated in the bell and all it needs to be is struck again. The bell is the perfect representation for the word om. Tom, if you will, T O M is like om, you see. So there's the strike. There's the sustenance of the sound, and then there's the return of the sound to the bell. The word is with God. So everything is sounding continually like that, and no time passes. Time happens at a much lower level. And so does space, and so does cosmos. So when you're in such a place as to hear the word Om, like the yogis do in caves and so forth, then you've transcended time at that point. You could meditate for uh, months and not know how long you've been sitting. Even in your one hour sitting tomorrow morning, which I hope you all do, your hour could seem like a minute if it was a timeless meditation. But one minute of your meditation could seem like an hour the next day if time is kicked in, you see. You feel all your sufferings, you feel your knees, you feel your back, you feel your mind restless. Not a good meditation, right? They say. Not that that's really the point. So, when, well, it's hard to say, the seers don't sit to meditate anymore. My teacher never came down to meditate with us in the shrine room. He made us do that. He wouldn't meditate anymore. Why? Because all of life had become a meditation to him. He was seeing God everywhere. He didn't need to sit down and try and see God anymore. Everything became God for him because he had practiced. And when the practice reaches fruition, everything was Brahman. Everything was the word. Everything was vibration. Uh, if he saw an ignorant person or a realized soul, they were the same Atman. One just wasn't <laughs> in recognition of it and the other was. That's the only difference. So if if uh, you practice meditation, then uh, you cut time down. There's a song in India that says, practice meditation and cut time down. That's one of the lines of the song. And so you're going to cut time down, kala, and you're going to cut space away because this space will disappear when you go into meditation. And when you go to sleep tonight, your bedroom will disappear. You'll be in some other place inside of you, you see some kingdom of heaven within you, you've gone to. And your eye may be open there, but you forget it when you come back through the veil of Maya. This is called the curtain of nescience in Buddhism, or the cloud of unknowing. It's a very 
difficult thing to penetrate through happens right about here. See, there's a membrane that keeps the separation between the third eye and the crown chakra. And there's another separation right between the heart and the navel, which is a grunty, it's called a knot, or a subtle membrane, which souls cannot get away from their ancestors. They keep being reborn, born into lower states of existence. So these are called gruntis, or curtains of nescience. Very difficult to penetrate in deep meditation. So you would be penetrating those if you left the world of objects and began to ascend. This would be called an inward ascension, not an upward ascension, I hope you realize. An inward ascension. Because that's why she says, I move through the three millions of nadis located in the sacred human form. Three million nadis. She's not talking about just your physical nerves, which are carrying prana, life force, but she's talking about nerves inside of nerves, which consciousness, intelligence flows through. And that's how souls get out of their bodies and back into their bodies, is through these subtle nerves. This body with its gross nerves is just an outer template, a sort of metaphor of the subtle body inside of you and the causal body inside of that. You thought of these little Russian dolls that you've seen that fit inside each other? It's like that. Your gross body fits inside the subtle body. That subtle body fits inside a causal body. And the causal body is in Brahman. Causal body is like Om. And all comes out again and goes back in all the time. Nice fit, you see. Perfect. Just like that. And it's also like the three states of your awareness. A-U-M. Waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. All these things connect in triputis. So if you spill out of the Pashanti level, then you come to the Madhyama level. It's called middling. Madhyama just means middling. And see what it says here? It says basically that thought vibration as concepts begin to appear. So in the Madhyama level, it would be like the inventor thinking of his inventions. He's got all these thoughts here. He hasn't put the thought of his object together with its form and this form of the object together with its meaning, and the meaning of the object together with its sound, and the sound of its object together with its actual form. All of these are disparate right now in his mind, and he's trying to bring them together, right? He's trying to uh, invent a slide rule. So he hasn't come up with the word slide rule yet, and he hasn't come up with the, all the concepts that are a part of that, but it's beginning to geel and come together. That's Madhyama stage only at her level. That is basically all worlds are beginning to formulate out of intelligence, out of her intelligence. They're beginning to congeal. Only beginning to though, they don't actually congeal until the gross state, the gross state of the word, vikari. So these four stages of the word are one way in which Veda and Tantra tells us of the beginning or the origins of all things and how everything fits back into consciousness and how it transcends maya. Now, the Vaikari stage there is knowledge made manifest. Read my chart. Knowledge made manifest. Thoughts, are, objects are just thought concretized. We have to start making that connection. And actually, when I said earlier in the class that you connect your eyes to sun, you connect your nose to earth, and your taste to water, that's what you're beginning to do. You're beginning to, you're beginning to realize, Panchakarna style, that your five senses created the five elements, connected to subtle senses, which are in your dream state tonight, connected to subtle elements, which are also in your dream state tonight. So if you say five, 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 and five, you have 20. Five gross elements, five subtle elements, five gross senses, and five subtle senses, right? So those 20 tattvas or principles make up your subtle and gross body, you see, make up your two states of your awareness. And they're your awareness. And you formulate your world every day. And you take it back into dissolution tonight in deep sleep. And you bring it forth again. And if you get 7 billion people doing this all at the same time, it seems very real. Collective consciousness is dreaming. It's mass collective mental dreaming is what's going on. And worlds are being formed and torn down all the time by it. 
depending on if they go into Perlaya, how often they go into Perlaya and how often they come out in sport. You say, oh, Johnny, can Johnny come out and play? You see, then the sport happens, you see. So when these people come out to play, that is when they come into form, they bring out of the word all of this potential called Shakti and they begin manipulating it. Some do it very poorly, some do it very selfishly, some do it very virtuously, some don't do it at all. Some stay away from it. Too dangerous. You get caught there. And so all levels of that kind of dynamism are there in the word. But this shows you in four stages how things come out of the word. So it begins to explain to you that cryptic statement of Christ when he said, in the beginning the word was, there was the word, it was with God and then it was God. And then it became all things. So it's another way of saying all of this is my own intelligence. I've given a word to tree, I've given a form to tree, that tree is a part of my thought process. I did all that at this stage. And I'm going to dissolve it. And there's not going to be any tree anymore, you see. The tree is held in potential here. The tree doesn't exist here anymore, even in thought. And this is how things come out of formlessness and go back into formlessness all the time, from the eternal to the non-eternal and back to the eternal in endless cycles. Buddha saw that, said, I want out. This was called koivalya, uh, separation from nature. I want to separate myself from nature. I do not want to be under the auspice of name, form, time, space, and causation anymore. I want to be free. I want to know my true Buddha nature. It took him 49 days. It took Christ about that time in the wilderness, right? It took Muhammad on the mountain about that time. They all go away for about 40 days. If you read all the different scriptures, there's this 40 day thing that's going on. See, with these souls that just all of a sudden decided, I want out of vibration. I want to see my vibrationless nature because I am my vibrationless nature. Why should I be anything else than perfect? Be thee perfect as thy Father in heaven is perfect. So with these ideas around the word Om, we'll look at him when we come back from our break. So let's take our break now. Thank you for your kind attentions. Om Masato Om Asato Ma Sadgamoya Tamaso Ma Joy Tir Gamoya Mrichor Ma Amritam Gamoya Abir Abir Mayeti Rudrayati Dakshina Mukam Tainamam Pahinicham Om Shanti 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 Lead us from darkness to light, from lower truth to higher truth, from the unreal to the real, from the illusion of death to eternal life. Reach us through and through, O Lord and Mother, with thy sweet and benign presence. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om. Sita Rama, Radha Krishna, Shri Shadda Devi, Shri Rama Krishna. Sita Rama, Radha Krishna, Shri Shadda Devi, Shri Rama Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Krishna, Shri Shadda Devi, Shri Rama Krishna, Sita Rama, Radha Krishna, Shri Shadda Devi, Shri Rama Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, 